Well, welcome to week two. Um, so far, setting up people's computers has been hit or miss, uh, especially those that are of the uh, Mac persuasion, which is not necessarily a surprise to me. Um, that have been said, uh, I'm going to pick up right where I left off last week, which was, I think, slide 44, if I remember off the top of my head. So I did 43 or 44, so I'm just going to go back to 40. Back to 43 and uh, start from there and then we'll dive into the week two lecture. I can hear you very clearly up front, which means everybody else in the room can hear you impeccably. That's what Discord is for. <laughs> okay. I usually don't demand absolute silence, but if I can hear you over me, it's, you know, too much. All right, so last week I left off talking about cardinality constraints, uh, which was essentially setting up the rules of how the relationships behave between entities. Um, essentially, it has to do with the number of instances that any given entity can have in relation to another entity. Uh, we talked a little bit about this already, where you know one teacher, many students, each student may have many teachers, but if for a course you'll have one teacher kind of thing. Um, and I'm pretty sure we had covered the minimum cardinality and maximum cardinality, meaning it's either zero or one, and it's one or more for the two categories. Uh, for the minimum, it's either zero, which is optional, or one, which is, means it's mandatory. And the maximum cardinality means um, at least one, and maximum of one, or many. There is no such thing as a, you know, two, three, or four is a maximum. It's either maximum of one or, you know, lots. There's no, there's nothing outside of those two options for the maximums. And there we go. All right, so last week I was actually, I think this is why I stopped because we actually had the slides up for this. Oh, left my laser pointer at home. All right, anyways, I'm going to use my mouse. Now, when we refer to the different cardinalities on the diagrams, this course is using something called crow's foot notation. And essentially, you have four symbols you need to memorize. It's not a lot, and they're pretty self-explanatory once you learn how to read them. So the... The way it works is from the end of the line, you read from uh, the inside out. So actually, let me just change to my pen. If when I say read from the end of the line, I'm talking, okay, this is the end of the line here, but you read it going towards the end of the line. And so when we read this, I'm just going to do that. The first one is the minimum. The second one is the maximum. So essentially, if the first symbol is a line, like this one and this one, it means it's mandatory, as in it must have a value. And on the other side here, where you see the circles, this is saying that it's optional, as in zero, as the minimum cardinality. So remember in the previous slide, I said minimum cardinality is either zero or one. There's your symbol, zero or one on the line. That's pretty straightforward. Now, the other symbol is the second one, which is gonna be either a line or the, literally the crow's foot. The line means one. Again, because there's one, and if you see the crow's foot, then it's many. So as we read each of these, it's saying that for this one, there must be one and only one. This one is, there must be one, but there can be many. And the last two at the ends is, optionally there's one, optionally there's 
one or more. So this is saying zero or one, this is zero, one or more. And if we look at this diagram at the bottom, it's saying that a patient has, must have a history and can have multiple entries, but each patient history can only be ever be associated with one and only one student. I mean, uh, patient. So he's talking about the student thing that I'm substituting the wrong words. So a patient can have, must have at least one history entry and they can have multiple entries. And by the same token, a, a patient's history entry cannot be created unless there's a patient associated with it. And a given patient entry can only be associated with the one patient. Which if you think about it, makes sense, right? You don't want your personal medical files associated with someone else. So they also get access to it. That's not quite how it works. And so for a one-to-many relationship, um, you can see that a flight can have multiple flight attendants. Um, AC123 has just the one flight attendant, which is set to Joe. LH456 is set up for that there's two flight attendants of Sue and Bob. And BA231 has Alice and Tom. So the cardinality is there must be at least one flight attendant. There may be multiple flight attendants. And that's basically what this is. So if I were to draw this, it would have been drawn like this. Because a flight attendant cannot be assigned to more than one flight at once. Can you imagine if they assigned a flight attendant to being two on two planes at the same time? That'd be a nice trick. Um, and the other side is, yeah, each flight may have more than one flight attendant, but it must have a flight attendant. That's actually the law. You're not allowed to actually have planes with more than so many passengers, not have a flight attendant. I don't remember what the minimum number is. I think it's 10. So any plane that has more than 10 passengers must have a flight attendant. Unless, of course, it's a flight crew that's transferring on the plane. But basically civilians. And, well, that's literally what I just finished talking about. I drew it on the other slide. And this is an optional one where Bob does not have any courses. Sue is set up to two courses and Jim is set up to one course. And the class is, does not have a teacher yet. Um, it's a bit like my daughter's uh, hardware course, I think it is, that she has. After the term, they still don't know who the teacher's taking over in July for that course yet. So, you know, the second half of the term is an unknown teacher at this point. Fun times for them. Um, and so the relationship would be drawn like this. A professor may have a class, may be assigned to more than one class. A class exists and may not have a prof yet. But each class can only be assigned one prof at a time. Is that kind of clear? It's not that hard a concept. It's, you know, for example, I'm assigned to uh, four classes this term. After the break, I'll have five. Um, each of those classes, you know, when they first set them up, did not even have teachers assigned to them. Right, the teachers were added in after the fact. And same deal, we could actually do the exact same thing with students and change the word professor for students, it'd be the exact same relationship. Because in theory, you guys could be registered, but not be assigned to any classes yet. Which is actually literally what it's like up till the day where your grades are approved by the department. Even though they start giving you your schedule before the grades are approved by the department, technically you're tentatively put in those classes. You're not in there guaranteed yet. Uh, that might come as a shock to some people, um, but it's not. Okay, um, now naming conventions is something I bring up in this class. Uh, it's, I don't enforce it too hard. Um, naming conventions have specifically has to do with physical diagramming more than anything else for this course. Um, it used to be that naming conventions were really loose and free and pretty much people did whatever the heck they wanted with it. Because uh, often when you got hired on by a company to work on their database systems, 
you often didn't leave. You were lifers back in the day. Nowadays, people change jobs every two years. Uh, usually, if you were a lifer, you tended to be, you know, use your naming conventions. That was that because you're the only one that ever needed to understand it. Um, and because way back in the day where we had severe limitations on our disk space, uh, naming conventions used to be pretty cryptic. I've seen desks, databases that have been migrated where that tables are called A1, A2, A3. And columns are literally AA1, AA2, AA3. Uh, it was terrible. Excuse me. I forgot to do not disturb myself. Now, yeah, cryptic database naming. Uh, with the day I inherited that database, if there was a way I could hire someone to break that guy's knees, I would have. Why? Because there was no reason for it. We weren't working on megabyte-sized drives anymore. We're working on, you know, well, they were megabyte-sized drives, but not like five megabytes. They were, you know, 250 megs, 500 megs was not an issue. Um, each company had its own standards. Often even each developer within a company would have their own thing and they'd just go to town. And it would cause all kinds of grief, as you can imagine, because one guy might not follow another, one person could not, might not follow another person's naming conventions and look at their database structure and you're going, why is this called AA1 and AA2? It should be called A11. Because that makes more sense for whatever reason. Um, yeah. But thanks to modern development frameworks, uh, there's a de facto standard that's starting to emerge. It's bubbling up from the depths. Um, and it really has taken up speed in the last, say, five, five to ten years. I know for you guys, five to ten years seems like a long time. For someone that's been working with database systems for 26 years, 27 years, um, it feels like a very recent change because, you know what, till about ten years ago, there was no standards. Like, everybody did whatever the heck they wanted. And the standard was basically forced by a product called Ruby on Rails. So some of you might be hearing, you've heard of Ruby on Rails, and people think that's an entire language. No, 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 no. The language is Ruby. The framework was called Rails. And it became the darling of the web development industry. Everybody loved it because it made things so easy. And then every other, other web language promptly copied them and made, made Ruby in basically dead language inside three years. Lots of people still have their products developed in Ruby. There's nothing wrong with the language. It's just nobody makes anything new in Ruby. Which always makes me laugh because Shopify is written in Ruby. <laughs> but, you know, they came out just as Ruby was picking up steam. Uh, PHP has its own frameworks. Python has its own frameworks. C Sharp has its own framework now. That's almost the same for their naming conventions. And the naming conventions came out to be as such. Everything is lowercase. So when you're doing your physical diagrams for this class, I expect you to follow these rules. The slide is up, so it should be on Brightspace for you. Everything is lowercase, no exceptions. Why? Because different database servers treat mixed case characters differently. Yes, we're using MySQL. And MySQL does not care because MySQL is not a very smart database. Um, a good database system is able to tell the difference between an uppercase I and a lowercase I. MySQL, you cannot do that unless you actually use ASCII codes to identify the characters. If those of you that don't know what an ASCII code is, uh, anybody here ever have to type letters in French on an English keyboard? You know, you go Alt-135 for your accent IQ, Alt-130 for your accent cav, right? Those are character codes. And if you want to find specific characters in MySQL, Uppercase, lowercase i, you actually have to use escape characters to find them. So MySQL doesn't care. Postgres, which is the second biggest open source database in the sense of spread, not by power, is super case sensitive. Like it cares a lot. Why? Because it was written in Uni on Unix systems originally, and Unix is case sensitive. Go figure. Uh, Microsoft SQL Server may or may not be case sensitive depending what code page you install it on. Install it on a North American code page, it's case sensitive. You install it in Cyrillic, it's not case sensitive. Install it in right to left languages, it doesn't care. But depending on which code page, so it becomes sensitive depending on which language the database server is installed on, which version of Windows, so to say. 
Oracle lies. Oracle stores both the version you put in originally and an uppercase version, so it's case insensitive. It just hides the uppercase version from you. So it doesn't care about the case of the tables because it lies and it just tries to be smart in the background. And the other issue is that every database server pretty much escapes their mixed case characters differently. MySQL uses backticks. Microsoft SQL Server uses square brackets. Postgres uses double quotes. I don't remember what Oracle does. I think it's double quotes also. That means you have to write different SQL for every database engine if you want to get clever. Don't use spaces. Use an underscore. Back to the case issue. In SQL, space is a command delimiter. So what happens if you put a space in the middle of a table name? You have to escape the table name. Then suddenly your SQL doesn't work everywhere unless you code your application to understand multiple syntaxes, which is terrible. Just putting it out there. As someone who's had to do it, it's a terrible thing. Um, tables are plural whenever possible. I'm not gonna actually hold that one down hard because depending where you work, some people insist that table names are singular. But in the Ruby on Rails, Cake PHP, Laravel, uh, this whatever ones that works with C Sharp, they like plural table names. So if you're talking about students, the table is called students because it holds individual records of a student. You have five students in a student's table. Uh, primary keys are always called ID. Again, why? That way nobody needs to guess what the primary key is called. Other places will have you do whatever you want for your primary key names. A very popular form of it would be table name underscore ID. So if the table is called students, they'd go students underscore ID, teachers underscore ID, courses underscore ID. Personally, I just like ID because you don't need to think about what it's called. And then the foreign key names is the singular table name of the parent plus the primary key name. So the user's table would become user ID. Why? Because it's the ID of a single user that you find in the user's table. It's just naming conventions. So you have them for reference. Okay, that's the end of last week's. And my mouse has taken that, there we go. Now go back to here. And now we're gonna dive into week two. Hopefully this recording is going like it should. Yes, it is. Excellent, all right. Um, Oh, it split the screen, you bugger. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, uh, actually when we do the physical diagramming, I'm gonna talk about the null, not null thing. Okay, so. Now today I'm gonna talk about diagramming or pick up from the diagramming that I should have done um, if I hadn't run a little along last week. Um, so, essentially, um, we're, I'm going to talk about entity relationship modeling, ER diagrams, um, and I'm going to talk about the process of modeling. I'm going to skip the cardinality review because I just literally finished doing it. The little review was in there to remind you guys for, you know, the next week. Okay. Now, a database can be modeled as two things, a collection of entities and the relationships between the entities. Pretty much what I was talking about last week and you know the start of this week. Um, database systems are often modeled using ER diagrams and it's basically a blueprint. Um, there's a couple of different levels of ER diagrams. There is a conceptual, a logical, and a physical. Um, there is no really big difference between a conceptual and a logical, but there's a big difference between a logical and the physical. So realistically, yeah, I'll show you guys what all three are, but the two we're worried about is logical and physical. Okay, 
So an ER diagram lets us basically sketch out the database. It's a graphical tool for modeling data. Um, it's used pretty much everywhere if you're working for a company that actually likes to document what they're doing. Um, not all companies like to document what they're doing, so, you know. Basically put, it's a picture that shows what the physical database looks like on the inside. If anybody here has ever seen blueprints for a house, same idea. Um, essentially, the ER diagram is there for two jobs. One, to make sure that everybody understands how things are interrelated. That's on the logical side. On the physical side, it's to also display how it's built. So you can think of the logical diagram as the concept drawings for a house. You know, when you, uh, if ever you're, you've noticed um, people talk, dis discussing what a house looks like and they'll have like, here's this concept drawing what the kitchen's gonna look like. And then they actually do the physical blueprint that actually has the dimensions and everything. That's the difference between a logical and a physical diagram. Now, for the database analyst and designer, the, it helps you have a better understanding of how the data is going to be held. It basically allows you to visually understand the structure. It's documentation, as I just mentioned. Um, and the conceptual diagram is really good to explain to the layperson how things are interconnected. Again, if you had a nice, you know, rendered sketch to show the client of a, say, their new kitchen, as opposed to the blueprint version, they're definitely gonna understand the nice sketch over the blueprint, because the blueprint's gonna have tons of dimensions and electrical wiring and, you know, cabinet one, two, three, four, and they're actually gonna be numbered, and there's gonna be all kinds of extra stuff on there. Whereas the conceptual, diag the conceptual diagram in the database is very high level. You can, you usually you can take one of those and take it to a manager and explain to them what this means. Um, if you're lucky, you're gonna work in a place that has a manager that understands how to read database diagrams. If you work in a small company like I do, no, your manager does not know how to read database diagrams and he has to take your word for it, which is kind of nice in its own way, I have to say. Um, but by the same time, when you try to explain to them why something's a bad idea, it takes a while. So the conceptual diagram, I spend a lot of time drawing on whiteboards. Well, I used to when I was still in the office, drawing on whiteboards of, you know, this is how this is connected using these exact symbols. Um, normally an ER diagram has four graphical components. The, uh, there is some slight variations on these that have different purposes. Um, which I will show you guys. Um, but essentially the four objects is an entity, which is a box, a relationship, which is a diamond. The diamond basically has a verb in it. Employee works in department. The cardinality, which you know is the lines of the crow's foot. And then if you are doing a slightly more fancy ER diagram, the attributes are in, are in ovals. Sorry, I can't see a circle in an oval. And I already talked about relationships that were optional and mandatory, so skip those. All right, so earlier I had the crow's foot up on the screen. And it's amazing, you know, when you cover some material in the same day, you can just skip like three slides instantly because they all mean the exact same stuff. Um, so those are the four symbols that I was talking about just before I you know, had switched slideshows. Now, on a conceptual diagram, the lines go from the diamond to the box. And basically put, there's nothing on the line side because the other side of the diamond will be pointing to another object. I'll show, there'll be slides with pictures in a minute. But essentially you can see how from the diamond it connects to the box and there's the mandatory one, the many, optional, and optional many. And essentially that's what it's gonna look like once we start diagramming. I actually have a really cool website you guys can use to do ER diagrams, way better than Visio. 
which right now is a 50-50 chance you can actually get because apparently they moved all our licenses to Visio Online, which does not work half the time. And uh, the other one that people use is Draw.io. And Draw.io is a general purpose diagramming tool, not made specifically for databases. And I have a really cool tool to, that's actually made to do this, that you get, and it's free to use. Okay, so we're gonna do an example. So in a model, we're gonna indicate that each school may enroll many students or may not enroll any students at all. And we wish to indicate that each student attends exactly one school. Um, now, at the college and university level, that's not necessarily the truth, because in theory, you could sign up for a course at Carleton if you wanted and take it, you know, in your copious free time that you have as full-time students. Or you might sign up to take music lessons from a high school because you'd be enrolled in a different school for that. But in high school and grade school, most students are enrolled in one school and only one school at a time, because that's just how it works. Um, so, Based on the two rules I just described, here's our diagram without the diamond. Now, if I had the diamond in here, it would show up right there. There's my awesome diamond that I just drew for you. Now, basically what this is saying is that the school may have a student or more than one student. However, a student can attend, must attend one school and only one school. Because if you're not registered at a school, you're not a student. Right? Does that make sense? You can't be a student if you're not attending a school. And being a student of life does not count. Um, on the other hand, a school theoretically can sit empty with no students. Such as the middle school down the street from my house that closed about four years ago. It's still there. There's just no students that go. They use it for other stuff now. And so when you, read it, the, when you read this slide, you can see that the school has at least zero students, in other words, it's optional, and at most many students, in other words, more than one student can go. And each student attends at least one school and at most one school. Oh, no. There we go. So when we create an ERD, we are going to follow the following steps. Uh, we identify the entities, or their attributes, identify a primary key if possible. Um, we'll identify the relationships between the entities, identify the constraints, draw it, then you check it. Because you should never ever submit work that you have not double checked. See, if you guys were in CP or CET, I'd say, would you hand in a Java application to your teacher that doesn't compile? The answer is no, because they're going to give you a zero. Apparently, that's what I've been told. That apparently, that class is really great for giving out zeros. One compile issue, and it's a zero automatically. All right, so. So what we're going to do is there's a... Basically, we're gonna follow some detailed steps in the following example. And it's literally all 10 steps, one after another. We're gonna identify the entities, find the relationships. We're, on the screen, we're gonna put in a rough ERD, fill in the cardinalities, define the primary keys, and then we're gonna turn it into you know, key-based ERD. So we have a paragraph. So if you don't have the slideshow opened up, this is a good spot to open it up. So go to like the Brightspace and pull down the slide deck for today because I'm going to be using this paragraph of text for the rest of the examples. And I, you know, it's a pain in the ass going back five or six slides every time I want to point something out. So, so to identify the entities, especially if you're given a paragraph of information, and you'll get specs like that where you get... Um, Basically, somebody sends you an email saying, can you design this? And they just give you a blob of text. Um, in a way, this is one of the freest ways to do database design. At the same time, it's one of the most treacherous ones because if you misread the message, you could botch the whole job. Um, but a popular way of doing it is you take the block of text and you highlight um, the words that you think belong to an entity. 
So in here we highlighted company. So a company has several departments, both highlighted. Each department has a supervisor. Notice we're not going to highlight the word department again because we already highlighted it once. We only highlight each concept once. And at least one employee. Employees must be assigned to at least one, but possibly more departments. At least one employee is assigned to a project. Oh, there's a new word that we haven't seen yet. But an employee may be on vacation, not assigned to any projects. And then the important data fields are the name of the departments, project supervisors and employees. And there's also employee, supervisor and project numbers. And a true entity should have more than one instance. So when we look back at this, although we highlighted the word company, realistically, there's only one instance of a company. I work for a and Algonquin College. I don't work for multiple Algonquin Colleges. Therefore, in their HR database, we're not going to have multiple copies of Algonquin in there. Therefore, in this case, even though we highlighted the word company, we can just drop it from our design because there's only one instance of it as far as we're concerned. So the next step is to figure out the associations between the different entities. And this is really old school, let me tell you. Like this is what they taught me when I was in college, when I took my database, my second database course in 1995. The grid looked exactly like that. So it has not changed guys, the concepts are the same. You learn this, you're good for a long time. So <laughs> the easiest way to figure this out is to do a relationship matrix. And you basically put the entities sideways and vertical, horizontal and vertical, so that they always line up, you know, first law is always the same one. And then we go through the paragraph again, and we can fill in the blanks. And we can figure out based on this, how things are interconnected. So a department has no relationship to a department, so it stays empty. Because there's no self we know nowhere in there did we talk about self-referencing uh, entities. So departments don't have a relationship with the department. A department is assigned an employee. A department is run by a supervisor. And nowhere was the word department and project used in the same sentence. So if you go back to the paragraph of text, which I will in a moment, you'll notice that project and department are never mentioned in context to each other. Therefore, there's no relationship. And then an employee belongs to a department. An employee has nothing to do with an employee. An employee has nothing to do with a supervisor because an employee belongs to a department and the department's run by a supervisor, but nowhere in that paragraph is a supervisor ever related to an employee by, in a sense. Although logically, mentally, that makes sense that a supervisor is in charge of a person. But, when we go just based on the facts that are given to us, no, they're not. Uh, this is where a person's life experiences tints their understanding of the data. And sometimes it's important to make sure you don't wear your, uh, you know, your life experiences, your life experience goggles on when you're looking at p other people's data, because it might be wrong. Or it might be right and their statement is wrong, right? So there's a bit of that too. Uh, a supervisor runs a department, no other relationships. A project uses an employee, and it has no other relationships. So, and if you don't believe me, feel free to reread that and see how the connections are. You'll notice that nowhere, other than the important data fields at the bottom, which have like this block down here, which do not apply, to the relationships, you will notice that not once is there an employee and a supervisor in the same line, and not once is there a project and a department in the same sentence. I bet you didn't think reading comprehension was going to play a part in this course. But that's the funny thing about working in database. You have to understand what you're working with, and often, it shows up as blocks of text. 
And believe it or not, this is one of those spots where I've noticed that um, ESL students tend to do a little bit better with the reading comprehension. Why? Does anybody want to take a guess why the ESL students tend to do a little bit better on the reading comprehension of this kind of stuff? Because often they have to work a little harder to understand what the sentence they're saying. Like we, a lot of, you know, written in your native language, you read a sentence, you might actually skip words when you're reading it. I know as sure as heck I skip words when I read English and French because I, it just comes automatically to me. When I look at the sentence, I can actually skip words and I still know what the sentence says. When you're reading a language that you're not comfortable in, you tend to read all the words. So reading comprehension is important. Make sure you read all the words. Otherwise, you might not understand what's actually happening. And my mouse. Okay. So we did this. So if we were to take our grid and convert it into basically sentences, this is what we end up with. And this, everybody in this room, is basically known as business rules. Be thankful that we don't test you on the concept of business rules in this course. Um, CSDD 215, we love business rules. Uh, but most of those students are studying to be business systems developers. So, you know, business rules are important to know. But essentially, once you've defined the relationships, these are known as business rules. A, bi an, a department is assigned an employee. A business rule should be clear, concise, and cannot contradict itself. In other words, it should not be a long sentence, and there should not be a lot of words in the sentence either. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee belongs to a department. An employee works on a project. A supervisor runs a department, and a project uses an employee. Each of those sentences are self-contained. They don't contradict any other sentence. And um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, that's the business rule. Clear, concise explanations of how everything is interconnected. So now, we would draw a rough ERD. So we would put entities in rectangles, diamonds and lines to represent uh, the entities. Um, in actual fact, we are going to go to here and skip those examples so that we actually have this. Now, you will notice we don't have the crow's foot notation on here yet. Because that comes a little bit later. So this is a what they call a rough ERD. In other words, We've drawn the pieces to show what's connected to what, but we haven't put in the final rules yet. So an employee works on a project. A department is run by a supervisor. A department is assigned an employee. So these are basically the four entities that we identified. And we basically took those rules and put them in. So if we take these three slides, we end up with this. So far, you could take this to a manager and explain it to them and they'd actually be able to, you know, once you explain to them what the little symbols mean, they could probably understand what is going on. A department is run by a supervisor. An employee is assigned to a department. Technically, a department is also assigned an employee, right? An employee works on a project. The project doesn't work on the employee, but, you know, you have to pick a direction to work with. So that's our rough ERD. So then we have to go back to the cardinalities, now the, the crow's foot side of the deal. And in the paragraph, we talk about how each department has one supervisor. Each supervisor has one department because not, not once is it ever mentioned that a supervisor works on more than one department. Each employee can belong to one or more departments. That's in the paragraph. Uh, each department must have one or more employees. That's in the paragraph. A project must have one or more employees. Again, that's also in the paragraph. But each employee can have zero or more projects because it says if they're on vacation, they're not assigned to any work. Now, in the real world, when you go on vacation, you're still assigned to a project, I'm just saying. Um, you know, but this is an ideal world. When you go on vacation, they take you off all the projects so you don't need to think about your work. 
So then we continue filling out the cardinality. So we are gonna convert those sentences into one and only one, one or many, zero or many, or zero or more, or one. And one more time, our symbols, as a quick refresher, before we slap it into the diagram. So whoever wrote these slides originally really liked showing these same symbols over and over and over again. Um, I'd rather just point them out on the diagram itself. So in here, we state that a department must be run by a supervisor and only one supervisor. Each supervisor runs one and only one department. So one to one relationship. An employee is assigned to a project, may be assigned to a project or more than one project. A project must have at least one employee, but probably more than one. And a department, an employee is assigned to one or more departments and the department has one or more employees. The way that we, again, the way you read these symbols to make it a little more obvious is this symbol represents how this is related to it. This symbol refers to this one. This one, these two up here, and I lost my cursor, are a little misleading because they're using the same symbol. But again, this one has to do with this one. This end has to do with that end. This one goes over here. This one goes over here. At first, this is one of the things that throw people for a loop is because they think, hey, the, the symbol closest to the object is the one that has to do with that object. No, 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 it's the one that, that's to talk, that symbol refers to the relationship of the other object, how it relates to the one you're looking at. So anything close to the employee has to do with the relationships of the other ones going into the employee. Right, so the relationship leaves the employee and goes into the department and the relationship leaves the department and goes into the employee. Okay, so some more of this. Again, a customer places an or one or more orders because they're not a customer if you didn't buy anything. Um, an employee uh, claims a dependent. An dependent is claimed by you know the employee. An employee may have zero or more dependents because not everybody has kids and some people have many kids. So zero, one or more makes sense. Um, same thing with teachers, an instructor may, may or not teach a class or they might teach multiple classes and each class is taught by one and only one prof. In this case, you guys could think of it as sections more than a class. Okay, so now we wanna throw in our primary keys. And in the paragraph, it did talk about important pieces of data. If I go way back, you will talk about, there's the, and I lost my cursor again. There it is. Okay. N supervisor, employee number, and a unique project number. So those are usually pretty unique. They're probably safe to be a primary key. And then we also have the names of the departments and stuff. So if I go way back, Oh, went too far. Okay, so we know that employee, project, and supervisors have numbers. They're probably a safe bet for a primary key. Our department, we know nothing. However, the odds of having a company with the same department name in t for two different departments is pretty small. This is one of those rare cases where an intelligent identifier is okay. If you guys remember what an intelligent identifier is, is when you use a real world piece of data to identify a primary key. Usually it's not a good idea because things can change, but by the same token, in this case, it's probably okay. I wouldn't do it that way all said and done, but conceptually it's acceptable. Logically, not. If you, know, if you can tell the difference between conceptual and logical, at the concept level, the department names are going to be unique, so we can use it as a primary key. When it comes down to it, 
and you actually implement for real, you're probably going to throw in a surrogate key in there just to be safe. Because, you know, I know my department at work has changed names at least twice since I've been there 22 years. Um, so, you know, you shouldn't use things that can change names as identifiers, but for this example, it's good enough. So then we want to identify the attributes. And this is the wall of text slide. And it's, it boils down to, um, you want to try identify name all the attributes that are essential to the system. Not necessarily trying to map them out to specific entity, because that, you might not be able to do that right away. With our little wall of text, it's fine like the little one we had because it's pretty clear. Um, but the best way to do this is take the forms, the files, reports, stuff that currently exists in a system that they want you to re-implement or that they want you to implement. And you end up circling it on the paper copy. Literally sit there with a pen and paper or a marker or a highlighter and you draw. Um, you can remove stuff that's not going to be brought across because sometimes the point of re-implementing is to get rid of trash. You don't want to carry garbage across unless you have to, because that's just bad. It's just noise. Um, and sometimes there's other stuff on a form that you'd look at that's extraneous, like a signature. You're not going to put somebody's signature in the database. That's just a legal requirement to make the bean counters and the lawyers happy. Um, and certain things like constant information, such as the company name and address, that's not going to change from person to person. You know, you create an invoice, it's not going to change invoice to invoice what the, per the company's address is. Um, so whatever is left after you've gotten rid of dead and extraneous is what you're going to want to make attributes for. And you should always verify these with your system users. In other words, um, after you think you've identified everything, you go take a lap around the company and you ask, hey, did I exclude anything you think is important and why? Or by the same token, did I include anything you think is not important or needed anymore? Again, follow it up with why. Because if you're going to exclude stuff or add stuff, you sometimes have to justify why you're doing it. Therefore, that's part of the question you're going to ask is why? Why do I need to add this or why do, I, do you want me to remove it? And then um, in our little paragraph earlier, the only attributes that were indicated were the names of the departments, projects, supervisors, and employees. And there was unique numbers for those. And then we map the attributes. So each attribute should belong to one entity. A supervisor's name belongs to the supervisor entity. The employee name belongs to the employee entity. An invoice date belongs to an invoice. A student name belongs to a student, not to an instructor. Therefore, each attribute you find should only ever land in one entity. If it needs to go to more than one place, you need to examine your data again to make sure you're not doing one of two things. One, uh, you're being too vague. Or two, you missed something. Maybe you just worked down the word name realizing that you know there's a supervisor name and an employee name and they need to need to re re relook at it so you can identify to yourself hey there are names for two different entities therefore we, maybe we should you know make them a little clearer um, and then when you have stuff left over that happens also um, it means that one of two things um, either you identified something that shouldn't be there at all or you missed an entire entity which happens regularly. Um, one that happens often when people don't think about it is when you place an order, uh, the, sh the name of the shipping company. The order will have a reference to a shipping company, but each order isn't going to have a plain tech, you know, the name FedEx will not be actually typed into every order. It's just picked from a list. So that's probably coming from an en other entity that you may have missed. Um, so if you identify anything you missed, you're going to add them to the relationship matrix and carry on. So back to the attributes. We identified the department name. 
employee number, employee name. This table's a little gross. It should actually just be one long table. Um, and I remember when this slide was made and we didn't have, we had a different aspect ratio on our screens and we had limits of vertical, so we went sideways with it. Um, but essentially we got uh, seven attributes with uh, four entities. So we're gonna take those and we're gonna tap them onto the diagram, which ends up being like this. Now this diagram looks a lot more complicated than the last one. And there's a reason for that. And um, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna cover it in a minute. Nope, I'm not. Well, I'll explain now. I'm probably, it's probably next week's slideshow. Um, I could have sworn I, oh, I'm using the wrong version of the slideshow. That's what this is. Anyways, um, originally, if we go back, way back, right here, you'll notice right here that we have a many-to-many -many relationship, right? Right here. And again, a many-to-many -many relationship. And at this level, that's acceptable. However, when you get to the point where you're getting closer to doing the physical design, database servers cannot do many-to-many. -many. Modern database servers are physically incapable of doing it. They're literally made to not let you do that. <laughs> so, because it's, it's a bad thing. So what you end up doing is you break out the many-to-many -many relationship, and I'm actually gonna talk about that next week now that I got my slideshow sorted out. So here we go. So we're gonna start with the supervisor right here, okay? So we know that we had a supervisor number and we have the supervisor name. You'll notice that the primary key is underlined on this diagram. Why? Because we need a way to identify the primary keys and underline is easy. Pretty straightforward concept. Over here we have the department name. <coughs> we know for a fact that the department only has one attribute because it's all that's ever mentioned in the paragraph of text. Um, we have the employee. Again, we know there's a name and a number. We know that a project has a unique number. So these are our original entities we had. We added the attributes to them, made sure things were had primary keys, and we've added the attributes that we've identified. Now for the stuff that is not circled. And I am going to change colors. Let's go with uh, green. Okay, so originally, and now I can't find my cursor. There we go. Originally this was drawn like this. And we didn't have that whole block below it. So when we start talking about going to a physical design, we need to break apart the many to many relationships. It's called, um, hang on, I'm drawing a blank. It's called, um, Oh, I hate it when I draw a blank. Resolving, there we go. We're resolving the many-to-many -many relationship. When you resolve a many-to-many -many relationship, what you're gonna do is, you know where you had that little diamond happening in the middle? That little diamond becomes another table or another entity. And this other entity is right here. No, I lost my cursor again. Where am I? Over here. So, so that original diamond that described the many-to-many -many relationship becomes a new entity that participates in a one-to-many. And the one-to-many goes from this way. One-to-many and many. So to give you guys a visual representation in actual physical format, 
Okay, when we started out, it was many to many, right? So we got our cos fit on both sides. If you watch my hands, for those that aren't actually looking, right? Look at my hands, you got many to many. When you resolve it, you got something in the middle. Do you notice how it was many to many at each end? And the middle was basically one. It becomes many to many. So the crow's foot point to the inside with the ones on the outside. Literally, that's physically what it becomes. And the one in the middle is going to be the associative entity. So in case you're curious what that's called, it's called an associative entity. Its purpose in life is to resolve many to many relationships between two or more other entities. So an associative entity, uh, there's actually going to be in next week's slides. I'm just fast forwarding a little bit because it's there. Um, so again, a department has multiple employees, an employee has multiple departments. How do we resolve it? We create an employee department table or entity so that that becomes the recipient of the many. And its primary keys are going to be made up of the primary keys of the other two tables. Clear as mud, eh? I am going to talk about this again next week, so don't panic. <laughs> now, the st last step is to check it. Um, is everything clear? So you try to put yourself in the shoes of the person using the system, and does it make sense from a non intimately comfortable with the information perspective? You also want to make sure your cardinalities are resolved, so there's no many-to-many's, there's no any of that. And then you look at the list of attributes and make sure you haven't missed anything. That's the check process. And then you take your conceptual, you convert it to a physical diagram. And did you guys actually have, did they make you look at any physical diagrams last term? Or they just made you query a database without actually knowing what you were looking at? I'm going to go with, uh, since I'm getting a lot of silence, that data may never made you guys look at a diagram and made you explore the database the hard way, which is fine. All right, so when you go from the conceptual to a physical, all the entities become tables, single valued attributes become a column, key attributes become the primary key, a multi valued attribute becomes a table, composite attributes become separate columns. Derived attributes are dropped, and then we give it data types, which our really complicated diagram right here becomes something that looks like this. Um, in actual fact, this diagram is wrong. Haha, <laughs> the other teacher did it and they did it wrong. <laughs> I just know I didn't notice it last term. Um, That should be like that, just for, just so you know. Um, and that was that. So that's not the entire diagram, but that's most of the diagram. Specifically, it's um, oops. If I remember right, yeah. So it's, they diagrammed this piece. So this more or less becomes this if you did the relationships in the right direction. A lot of people prefer that view because software developers like knowing data types and they like to know concisely what things are. This is much harder for a manager or a client to understand. Okay, so now I said I was going to tell you guys about a website that you can use for your um, diagramming in one of the labs. Okay, I'm going to stop. So the website's called ERD Plus. And I can never remember if it's .com or .org. So ERD Plus is actually a website that some uh, textbook developers wrote. 
Not the one where we don't even use the textbook in this class. So, um, however, the good news is it's free to use. When you sign up, you just literally put in your information and away you go. I'm just going to log in. And it looks like this. I'm going to go new diagram. I'm going to give it a name. And it's an ER diagram. I'm going to go create. And it has all the tools. Not showing on the screen, of course not. Because PowerPoint. You know, it never used to do that before. Not this badly. Try that again. And now I bet you my recording is no NFG. Uh, we're going to hope for it. Okay, anyways, for those that are here, you're good. So, website's ERD+, and if I'll, let me just start over again so you can actually see what it looks like. Website looks like this when you hit it. Sign up is absolutely basic. You put in your name, your email address. You can use any email address you want. It doesn't care. Uh, when you log in, you end up with something that looks like this. Basically looks like a file manager. And you go new diagram and you give it a name. Last time I created one called Blarg, so I'm going to go back to Blarg. And in here we have the tools to create our various items. So we can add an entity, plunk it here. Add another entity, plunk it there. Change its name. So we created our two entities. We can um, connect the two entities by drawing a line between them. There's our diamond. And in here you can go, uh, you can do our different cardinalities based on what it is. And we can also add our attributes. And that's a unique, we can add just for a regular one. Now, there are a few other diagram items that we didn't see in the slides. And um, one of them is the double diamond. That's for an identifying relationship. So remember last weekend I talked about the weak entities versus the strong entities? A weak entity will often have an identifying relationship. That's why you look at, if you look at the relationship box here, let me just uh, zoom in a bit. Nope. It's not doing a very good zoom. So it'll be a double diamond. If it's not identifying, it's single. It's not that big. Um, you can say something is weak and it's again double lined. So if it's identifying, you'd have probably have a weak one in the go. But I am not going to hold you guys to those symbols. As long as you use the square, the diamond, and the ovals, I'm happy. Um, as far as attributes go, there is a few other cool ones. Um, a composite one, which shows up as in parentheses. Let's see if I can make this bigger. So an address is a composite attribute. Why is it a composite attribute? Because it's made up of multiple other attributes. If we were to take an address and explode it to its component pieces, we could go like such. And you can see that what it's made out of. If you decide to go to this detail, fantastic. I'll be happy if you just get the diagrams right <laughs> at the basic level. Um, the only other ones that you'd have in here also are <coughs> multi-valued, which would be um, drawn like such double lines. A multi-valued attribute is an attribute that's made of a list of values. Realistically, the multi-valued becomes its own entity when you're done. So, 
this tool is really nifty this way um, because it uses the same terminology I'm teaching you guys as opposed to draw.io which is using one terminology and Visio, who knows what it's going to do. Um, and when you're done, it'll save it automatically into this website. You can also go export as a, basically as a PNG. And there you go. Um, there is a few things you can put on here also, which is cool. Uh, you can throw on a label because, you know, you want to identify you did the work yourself. And that's about it, actually. That's what this project, this product does. It'll do physical diagrams. It just doesn't do it as well as MySQL Workbench. So if you want to use this for your lab where you have to do the um, diagramming, which I think is lab three. Yes, for sure it's lab three. Um, maybe the end of lab two, but that you could use this tool if you wanted. Okay, so outside of that, uh, that was today's info dump. So what else should you guys be working on? That's always the next follow-up question. Okay. For those of you that have not uploaded your screenshots yet for lab one, please do so. Anybody who's got a Windows PC that's still having problems, I can absolutely help you. If you're not running a Windows PC, there's a couple of other Mac users in here that could probably help you way more than I can ever help you. Um, so you're going to be doing lab two starting this week. And um, essentially, there is two tasks. And you are going to read these two tasks and you're going to answer. Uh, the set of questions. And then the third task is, um, again, you'd identify the primary keys based on what the data seems to be there. Using the concept of a primary key is usually unique. You identify the, uh, if they're related, how they're related, that kind of stuff. You give it to me as a Word document that you upload to Brightspace. Um, next week, the lab three is the diagramming. So, as it stands, you guys have everything you need to do lab two. You have until the 27th to um, do lab two. Lab one is due Friday. If it's not submitted at time and you have not warned me, you can guess what grade you get, right? Anybody want to take a guess what grade you get if you don't do your, you don't submit your work after the VLAD disappears? I'll give it to you, I'll give you a big guess. It's the easiest one to give. Because I don't need to think about it. Um, I don't even make it as a threat. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a fact. So lab two is assigned as of this week. You can work it in lab. You can work at it at home. You literally got two lab periods to do it. So knock yourselves out. Um, Outside of that, I will try to get the recordings up. This should be an interesting one now that it's been sliced into three pieces because PowerPoint insists on doing whatever the heck it thinks it's doing. And uh, yeah, it's been a good day. We're off a little earlier than last week, which is good. Have a good afternoon, folks. Go stretch your legs, go get some sunlight. It's a little cool, but at least it's vitamin D. You're not gonna cook to death like last week, yes. Yeah, just let me give me a chance to sh shut down here, like stop my recording and stuff, and then I can give you a hand. Yep. Yeah.